the planetary nebula of hd curtis on episode 410 of the actual astronomy podcast i'm chris and joining me is shane we're amateur astronomers who love looking up at the night sky and this podcast is for everybody else who likes going out under the stars we have a new patreon supporter shane this person really likes to go out under the stars let's give him a thank you yeah, this one put a smile on my face. Uh, big thanks to Ron, our newest Patreon supporter. And as always, thank you to all of the Patreon supporters. We definitely appreciate it. Um, should I take a read of his Go for it. message? Yeah, so Ron said, I'm a new Patreon supporter, although due to the podcast, I myself may need to ask for Patreon supporters. <laughs> That's what put a smile on my face. Um, he said, I bought the refractor to get the wonderful wide field views and to be able to set up quickly to do all sorts of observations, including my plans to start studying the moon more carefully. I've just started using the Teleview NP 101 in the backyard of my Bortle six ish skies, uh, to get to know the scope. And last night, which was March 14th, uh, I put the scope on the 20% waxing crescent, uh, boy, was I in for a surprise. The moon was floating amongst a beautiful field of stars. I had never seen this before. And I thought, wow, this is a magical scope. It even shows stars in the glow of the moon. The view was breathtaking. Then I realized it was the Pleiades. Uh, I got my wife out of bed to look at it. And at first she was not keen on getting up, but when she looked through the eyepiece, she was simply amazed seeing the moon floating amongst the beautiful stars. I'm looking forward to getting the scope at, to some dark skies. Fortunately, I can drive to the mountains to get Bortle for clear skies at some altitude. Thanks from Ron. And Chris, I think he has, a, does he have a reflector or a Cassegrain? Because I, I thought the MP101 is like a second scope in his it collection. Is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's got a second scope there. And uh, I was just taking a piece of his email, mm -hmm. out, but uh, he's got a 16 inch Explore Science and a... Right. Taurus 20 inch F ratio. I feel like it was faster, but I looked on their website, it says four two. But if for some reason, I think he his was going to be faster. And that's uh, coming to him from Poland, I think in July is his due date. So I wow. uh, asked for an update once that scope arrived. Because um, I think that's uh, a scope that is definitely of interest to many people. Uh, mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, really, thanks uh, so much for your support, Ron. We really appreciate it. The part that I liked about his email, we, I didn't put the whole thing in, um, but he, but he, I think the title was Best Podcast in the Universe, so <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. But I think I think Ron works in the schools, and I was you know, asking like who he observes with. I think he should start a school astronomy club. I feel like schools have astronomy clubs often. Yeah, yeah, I think some do. I, I think it typically requires a passionate teacher to, you know, that probably has an interest in their own life and astronomy to, to, yeah. you know, really make it happen. But, uh, it's a great place and you know, who, you know, I, I've never really seen anybody that's not interested in looking through a telescope and maybe they don't have interest right at the start, but once you show them the moon or Saturn or, or, you know, other objects in the night sky, uh, they become fans very quickly. Nice. Yeah, I agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. We've certainly done uh, lots of work in the schools. I've gone and done presentations to astronomy clubs in schools, actually, now that I think about it. Um, yeah, there's there's usually some. They do require like a passionate teacher, somebody. I think most of the ones that I've been in, they have relatively uh, limited sort of hands-on experience. So usually that's why I'd be getting contacted. But Somebody like Ron, who who I do believe works in the schools, I think he would be uh, a great person to start such a venture at the schools. Pretty cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some planetary nebulae or nebula. I always like nebulae. It sounds a little bit more old-timey. And as somebody who does probably more old-timey observing than modern observing, I like to use that term. Fair ball. Fairball. And I should add, I am tired today. I don't know. I, keep, I was telling Shane, I keep waking up at five o'clock in the morning and not being able to get back to sleep. So earlier, earl, earlier this week, I was thinking, you know, there's all that stuff about, you see it online, you know, get up at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. and blah, 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 changed my life, best thing ever kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. No, not for me. Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> this is not good for me. This is, this is a bad thing. This is day number two. This is the last day I'm doing this in my life. I'm never getting up at five o'clock in the morning again. 
Yeah, it must be something in the air. That's been my life the last week, I think. I've been up at about five every day and I just cannot figure it out. I think oh well. I think for some people, I think they can do it. Um, but for me, I I need to, you know, sometimes I just need to get up. Like sometimes I just need to get up. I'll just get up, like at the window or something. I don't know, I just need to get up and move or something and then go back to bed. And usually what I've been doing for the past long time is getting up at like about five to nine on a Sunday. And, uh, yeah, and that seems to work a lot better for me than getting up at, uh, five or quarter after five, like I did today, but I am getting some stuff done at that hour, but I also find, to be honest, I find I'm not that productive. Like I, I uh, wrote up the show notes, uh, for the show that we did with Mark Radici yesterday and did some other stuff, but new not a great thing. I think I wrote up these notes as well. So talking about planetary nebula, had you ever heard of Herbert Douse Curtis or HD Curtis before Shane? No, that does not ring a bell. He was an American astronomer, lived from uh, 1872 to 1842. And uh, what he uh, is, is known for amongst other things is did a pile of eclipse expeditions and uh, was an advocate and theorist, um, for the uh, existence of galaxies outside of the Milky Way. And he uh, was, of course, involved in the 1920 uh, Shapley-Curtis debate concerning size and galactic structure of the universe, of which I think uh, some of that stuff has been debunked, but I think it was sort of, you know, part, part of the scientific process. But the, the thing that I was most interested in, and I'll mention this, is that... Um, Randall Rosenfeld, he uh, brought this to my attention, was that in 1920 to 19, uh, or 1902 to 1920, Curtis worked at Lick Observatory, and he was continuing on with a survey of nebula, which was started by Keeler, known of the Keeler Gap fame uh, on, on Saturn. But anyway, Curtis headed up the uh, Lick Southern Station in Chile for a variety of years, and then... Uh, he uh, returned in 1912 to take charge of the, uh, or 1909, he returned to take charge of the Crosley uh, Telescope, which uh, is a, a 36-inch reflector there uh, at Lick Observatory. Lick Observatory um, is just outside of San Jose, California, which wasn't too far from where I was back 25 years ago. <laughs> And uh, I, I guess I spent the winter 25 years ago with uh, with the Lick Observatory, almost in sight of of my workplace. And so I took a Sunday and and drove up there and uh, and was able to walk around at night. It was too late for the public tours and he, to get in on the telescope viewing with their uh, their large refractor, which I also think is 36 in Jelvin Clark. Uh, any anyhow, I did get to wander around on site there one evening when all the domes were opened up and sort of sneaked up and around the buildings and found Barnard's old cottage, which is now burned down. So that was kind of cool to see. But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm rambling on there a bit. But in 1918, Curtis observed uh, M87 and was the first to notice that uh, polar jet as a, quote, curious stray light, apparently connected with the nucleus by a thin line of matter end quote and mark radici actually referenced seeing that in a 32 inch at the winter star party and we just spoke with him mm -hmm. yeah that's uh, an incredible observation mm. that mark had and you know any time spent with a 32 inch has got to be absolutely amazing yeah so curtis was the one who first uh took a look at that uh also in 1918 he authored this section on planetary nebula and I, I believe it's sort of like the annals of the Lick Observatory that, you know, one of those things that they used to do, probably still do in a lot of these older institutions is write sort of this lengthy kind of annual set of publications. And and this was like volume 13 of the annals of blah, blah, blah. It's something like that. I'm probably getting it wrong. But anyway, he wrote part three, which was on the planetary nebula. And it's uh, quite a few pages, I think, uh, couple dozen pages or something like that. Uh, but what this was, was Curtis using the 36 inch cross reflector on Mount Hamilton, um, where Lick Observatory is located just outside of San Jose in California. And the survey had, uh, taken a look at all the planetary nebula north of declination 
negative 34 degrees south. So mm-hmm. basically, um, but but that negative 34 degrees south is sort of a declination you and I are familiar with, Shane, because that is just about as far as mm-hmm. as from here we can see down to the horizon from mm-hmm. from our neck of the woods. Now, of course, with the big 36-inch reflector in the observatory, this is capturing objects that are, you know, 15 degrees above the horizon, whereas for us, they're like a degree and a half above the horizon. However, it does sort of place, um, I think, all of these uh, planetary nebula, of which I think there's about 78 in his list, within uh, within grasp of our telescopes here. Should add that M1 is on the list, which we know is a supernova remnant now. But anyhow, what is a planetary nebula, Shane? I put a quote in here from the... Uh, from the Hubble site, but maybe do you sort of have a Cole's note that you can summarize in your own mind, or do you want me just to go ahead and read out what this says? <laughs> well, you know, for me, it, it's just typically they sort of resemble a little bit of a planet because they're, they look like an mm. orb or sort of a circle. Um, so kind of, I think it, at the simplest definition, that's a part of it, or at least it is for me. Um, but why don't you uh, go into the Hubble definition here or, or Herschel definition or whatever one it is. Yeah. I kind of sort of mashed in a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Most of this came from the Hubble site, which is a, uh, well, as, as a non astrophysicist and, and neither of us are astrophysicists here, but I thought it was important to kind of put in a, uh, a reasonably understandable version of what a planetary nebula is, but what it is is a region of cosmic gas and dust formed from the cast off outer layers of a dying star. Basically, same thing's going to happen to our sun here, I think, in so many billion years, right? Yeah, I believe that's the belief. Um, not sure any of us will be around to confirm it, but <laughs> sorry, uh, for sure. I don't have plans past, you know, 38,000 BC anyway. Anyway, um, Despite their name, planetary nebulae have nothing to do with planets. The misnomer was given to the objects by early observers, such as William Herschel and others, uh, who compared them to planets due to that uh, circular appearance that that you mentioned, Shane. Basically, they look round, they look faint, they kind of look like planets because they are very round in nature, right? Eh? Yeah, exactly. So what's a planetary nebula that you would be familiar with that the listeners might also be familiar with? Um, probably the ring nebula is one of the more popular ones. Um, Right. Yeah. And when you look at that through a really small, like a three inch telescope or, you know, even a larger telescope under low power, it just does look like a round little thing to, or even reasonably bright fuzzy circle, but not, it's not even fuzzy on the edge though. And that's, I think why they got hung up on this whole planetary nebula name because uh, the edges tend to be sort of the brightest and most well-defined uh, areas of these objects. They tend to be a little bit fainter in the middle. So I think that's where it comes from. Yeah. Yeah. makes sense. And, you know, when I look at planetary nebulas, I often think about some of these early observers and, you know, they're, I don't know if you'd say sort of not confusion, but kind of questioning, like, what am I looking at? And mm-hmm. it's uh, just sort of a, a romantic thought that I typically have uh, throughout the night. When stars with an intermediate mass greater than about 80% of our sun's mass, uh, but less than uh, eight times its mass die, uh, what happens is they expand uh, and they form into a red giant. And then uh, now this star is dying and it's going to continue to expel gas and dust and s- such uh, well, simultaneously, the remaining core of that star contracts and begins to radiate energy again. So the energy causes the expelled gas to ionize, meaning that the atoms and the molecules and the gas become charged and begin to emit light. So they're generating light on their own. It's not just reflecting light from the remnant star that's inside. The gas itself is luminous. It is given off light. And this cast off glowing gas is known as the planetary nebula. So in essence, it's the star giving off gas that's going out into space, and that gas itself is illuminating. Therefore, the planetary nebula are classified as a mission nebula and are entirely unrelated to planets. But uh, that's just kind of the that's just kind of the way they look. They last about twenty thousand years, which is uh, relatively short lived on the cosmic scale. But 
First planetary nebula, that was the uh, Dumbbell Nebula discovered by Charles Messier on July 12th, 1764, listed as M27 in his catalog of nebulous objects. So that's probably one that you're pretty familiar with uh, as well, Shane. But that one doesn't look like a planetary, though. No, no, it doesn't fit that circular definition, but it's a beautiful planetary to look at, Um, especially like even small aperture starts to reveal its unique shape, but larger apertures you can really start to see structure and detail within that nebula yeah it kind of looks like an apple core uh rises pretty high in the northern hemisphere up there in volpecula in the summer milky way so uh Mm -hmm. you know typically an object that most people uh, become familiar enough to find without the aid of star charts or anything i know i can't remember the last time i ever used a chart star chart to even find m27 i just kind of i can pretty much just put the telescope right on it not because i have any special magical skill or anything it's just that you know when you go out hundreds or thousands of nights in the summer or whatever you eventually just know where that darn thing is pretty cool Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nature of the planetary nebula remained unknown until the first spectroscopic observations were made back in the mid 19th century uh, by William Huggins, who is using a prism to uh, disperse their light and to study the spectrum of astronomical objects. So back in 1864, Huggins was the first to analyze these uh, spectra. And in particular, he took a look at the Cat's Eye Nebula. I think that's, uh, forget the NGC number, but it's up there in Draco. And his observations of uh, of these objects determined that it was these that there were these dark lines that were superimposed over the spectrum. And when Huggins looked at the Cat's Eye Nebula, he saw a strong continuum with absorption lines superimposed and uh, other similar objects showed the same emission lines. The brightest of these were at wavelengths of 500.7 nanometers, uh, which did not correspond to any known elements. So at first, the hypothesis was that uh, they'd found a new element, which I love the name, Nebulum. <laughs> Mm. or nebulium, one or the other. I, I thought it was uh-huh. nebulum, but maybe I made a spelling error. But Henry Norris Russell proposed that uh, rather than being a new element, it was probably a more familiar element in unfamiliar conditions. And it turned out it was just uh, double, uh, doubly ionized oxygen, basically uh, a, a familiar element, uh, just sort of in an unusual environment in space and uh, being ejected from a star kind of caused it to be at uh, first uh, misinterpreted. But going back to Curtis, he had the uh, goal in mind to create photographs and illustrations of the planetary nebula in order to aid in new theories on the lives and structures and ended up cataloging 78, though, as I mentioned, M1 was among those in his list, later known to be a supernova remnant. Uh, but my friend Randall drew my attention to this and the article, and you can just Google Curtis, 1918, Lick Observatory, The Planetary Nebulae. You can even put part three in there if you want. And and you'll find the article. Read the full citation. It's it's easier. And the reason why Randall sent it to me is that, uh, well, when Curtis was working on his paper, he was trying to create um, these really detailed drawings because the photographs from the Crosley of the small nebulae were difficult to enlarge. So typically what uh, they might do, even to this present day, I, I you know, w- would, would think, but maybe less so because of modern equipment and techniques and such. But back in the day, they would take that photograph on the plate and then go through an enlargement process to make it bigger and easier to study. That that worked well with certain things and especially like larger planetary nebula like M27 or the helix or ones of, of that sort, ones that are larger than 30 arc seconds. However, with these smaller ones, tiny ones like NGC's 6,000s and 7,000 objects, um, you could still see some detail. And so what he was doing is drawing those out. And so Randall mentioned that uh, I might be interested in what he had to say. So what Curtis has to say about this drawing process of actually using photographs to draw, which actually this kind of dovetails nicely to what Mark was talking about, drawing from his computer screen, which many people might uh, think is sort of a funny thing, but I was thinking about this when Mark was talking, is that he is kind of like in a way carrying on a modern tradition of transposing what you see with your eye, whether it's on a computer screen or a photograph, and then creating a 
a, a recreation of that. So Curtis goes on to talk about this. He says, in many cases, the sketches give a better idea of the sum total of the structure features of a planetary nebula than an, enormous, than an enormously enlarged photograph could have done. So I was interested from a sketching perspective, but uh, taking a look at all these planetary nebula was uh, pretty neat because most lists uh, for planetary nebulas that I've thought about accomplishing are uh, going to have objects that are below our horizon or too low. Whereas I think this is a nice list for somebody like like me that lives up here in Saskatchewan because theoretically, Shane, I can see all of these through uh, through my telescope at my observatory. <laughs> so I like that idea. Hmm. Is this something you're pursuing then? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm going to pursue this one. One of the reasons, um, and we were talking about this with, with Mark a little bit, for using really high power is that when I have the seven inch running high power and that scope, like 300 and something power, uh, is, is a nice power. And with the tracking on that scope will be nice to, uh, to maybe do some of these sketches of the, uh, the original article. So I'm kind of interested to do that. Some of them are big, some of them are small and O3 filters help make observations of planetary nebula, uh, much easier. Do you have an O3 filter? Yeah, I've got uh, a couple. I think I have an inch and a quarter and uh, a two inch as well. Mm. And have you tried those in any planetaries? I don't think I have. I, I don't use the O3 all that often. Oh, I don't use filters all that often just to put that out there. But the O3 is probably, it, it just doesn't get into my optical path. It, if I put something in, it's usually the UHC. Yeah. Uh, when I use the O3, it's probably for like the veil, you know, um, and I don't, I just don't use filters enough to probably even warrant owning it, to be honest. Yeah. I put them all on slide. I use them quite a bit. I had them in my slide filter on the, uh, the refractors and then, you know, kind of just put them out on the, uh, what do you call it? The sort of the back, what's the thing that comes down in the back of the truck? Tailgate. Anyway. The tailgate, that's it. And just put them on his tailgate and then we use them when we're using his uh, 12-inch telescope. But the old three filters, um, they help because they're designed for diffuse and planetary nebulae. The O3 filter um, is a narrow band filter and that isolates the two doubly ionized oxygen lines of 496 and 501. And as mentioned, um, that, that peak uh, earlier that was... Uh, discovered by Huggins was at 500.7. And so these filters are specifically designed to work very well for planetary nebula. One of the other things, which is a little bit odd with the planetary nebula and the filters is, uh, especially once you get eight inch or 10 inch scopes, or you know, hopefully even a seven inch refractor, um, be able to uh, to use much higher power than than you typically might otherwise with a filter, it, uh, you leave that in, you can still see quite a bit of detail. So to observe uh, planetaries, one can use a combination of wide field for the targets as well as high power. Some of the ones on uh, the list that Curtis has are the Helix, uh, which is in Aquarius. We've got M57, of course, up in Lyra. Talked about M27. Um, also something like the Lemon Slice, uh, and then as well, there's just like this whole long list of different objects that Curtis has in his um, in his list. I thought I had it open here, but maybe for some reason I had closed it down. But he's got all kinds of really tiny, he's got all kinds of really tiny targets that he put in, in the list. And it's also really neat. I was able to find a website um, I didn't mean to put that in. I had meant to put that in my notes as well, showing um, like where everything is in the nighttime. Uh, all these targets are in the nighttime sky, as well as many of the sketches that uh, that Curtis had done. Because in the article, unfortunately, uh, they're a bit too too dim, sadly. But uh, anyhow, that's uh, that's kind of my little bit there on some planetary nebulas that uh, I'm sort of taking on as a, as a bit of a project just to uh, sort of warm up the new scope once I get it up and running. So nebulas and high power, I think, uh, goes hand in hand with uh, having a nice refractor to use. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 
How about you? Do you have any uh, sort of astronomy and observing plans for uh, for the upcoming season once we get into warmer weather? Well, so I usually, I do, yes. Uh, and I usually um, come at it from two different ways. You know, what can I observe from my light polluted backyard? And I'm nearing the end of the RASC double star uh, list. I only... I only have two more of the winter stars and then a handful of uh, spring and a, a small handful of summer ones to observe. So I'll be finishing that soon and I need something new for the backyard. So I'm going to start looking at uh, different open clusters. Um, mm -hmm. So I have a, a list that I'll be working through there. And then for the dark skies, I'll just continue working through uh, Omira's hidden treasures uh, until that one's complete. Yeah. Yeah. I was able to find my... Uh the planetary nebula by curtis yeah so there's a lot of different ones that he lists here like ngc 6543 um ngc 6445 6563 all kinds of ones i've never looked at before some of them look almost stellar um some of them do look pretty big and interesting 6572 and then like i just a lot of the time when i've looked at planetary nebula it's just uh 6620 I don't think I've ever seen 6629 I think I have seen because I think that one's up in Cygnus some of them are pretty small 6644 of course that's going to be a little bit low down negative 25 but uh, yeah I was just thinking a lot of these are going to be objects that uh, I just probably haven't seen before and definitely haven't hunted down myself they might have been other in other people's telescopes or something and anyway I just thought it'd be a, be a neat project to tackle but yeah some of these i've never six seven nine zero pretty small one six eight oh three looks pretty good six eight oh four looks pretty good six eight oh seven is tiny but yeah the list just goes on and on 78 of these then we got six eight seven nine doesn't look too bad looks like it has some extension six eight eight one looks pretty good it looks pretty big um yeah so it's a pretty nice list of people that are interested it's just under the harvard abstracts people want they can even search for me i've got i think 30 reviewed articles in the harvard abstracts and all kinds of weird and wacky observing projects i think when i write what i like to do is sometimes take an article like this shane and if i can this would be probably my my most ambitious one of these yet is is to take an article like this from curtis and if i if i can if i can do it <laughs> is to go through and do all the sketches and then do like a reply to his article and then it would go into the harvard abstracts like get it published in a journal and then it would go into the harvard abstract so when someone searches for that paper they would see his and then they would see my paper with all like my own janky sketches from 2024 uh you know basically you know 105 or 106 years after the publication of of his work it's kind of neat to uh to do something like that sometimes just for fun Mm -hmm. so that's it that's my little project that's what uh what i'm working on here i'm just trying to get back to my notes i don't think i ever will but uh yeah just a little fun project that i thought people might be interested in yeah cool yeah do you have anything to add before we conclude this short show that is all chris well thanks for listening everybody be sure to subscribe send us send us your show ideas observations and questions to actualastronomy at gmail.com thank you everyone for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show if you are interested in more information would like to contact us or if you would like to support the podcast check out our website actualastronomy.com